Lord, and walking by faith. <clears throat> we thank you all for, again for joining us this morning. Look, I was just waiting to hear all of y'all say good morning, but I know <laughs> we are audio. Uh, we thank again you all for joining us this morning. Uh, let us go before the throne of grace. Father, we thank you this morning. We give you honor, we give you praise. Thank you, Father, for this day that you have allowed us to see. We thank you, Lord God, for we're celebrating our independence with you, Lord God, because as we receive your son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, Lord God, it gave us freedom, Lord God, that this world cannot give us. Now, Father, as we go forth in this day, Lord God, to worship you, Lord God, to give you honor, to give you glory, Lord God, Father God, we ask that, Father God, that you continue to saturate our heart with your word, give us instructions for our daily living, Lord God, leading us down the pathway of righteousness for your name's sake. And we'll be ever so mindful to continue to praise you, to glorify you, to magnify you, Lord God, and lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Scripture. That's you muted. You muted, Pastor. <laughs> Amen. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna help you out, Sister Linda. I chatted with you there. Uh, it should be John, the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. Amen. Uh, beginning with verse number 23, down through verse number 30. The Gospel of John, those of you all who are out there, if you would please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, verses 12th chapter, verses 23 through verse 30. Amen. Amen. And the word of God reads, Jesus said to them, the time has come for the Son of Man to receive his glory. It is a fact that a grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die before it can grow and produce much more wheat. If it dies, it will never be more than a single seed. Whoever loves the life they have now will lose it. But whoever is willing to give up their life in this world will keep it. They will have eternal life. Whoever serves we, me must follow me. My servant must be with me everywhere I am. My father will give honor to anyone who serves me. Now I am very troubled. What should I say? Should I say, Father, save me from this time of suffering? No, I came to this time so that I could suffer. Father, do what will bring you glory. Then a voice came from heaven. I have already brought glory to myself. I will do it again. The people standing there heard the voice. They said it was thunder. But others said an angel spoke to him. And Jesus said, that voice was for you and not for me. And you have a, your ears have a hear, hearing to the word in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. I messed it up. Let us bow our heads. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you again as you touched us this morning, as we have laid down on last evening, waking us in our right minds with the blood running warm in our veins, that you allowed us to have food, clothing, and being able to have functions and use of our arms and our legs, being able to think with a clear mind. Father, we ask that you continue to watch and bless those that are in the hospital, the convalescent home, and those that are home that are ill as we continue to lift up those that are in the congregation that are going through a healing process. Father, we're also praying for those that are our close friends and relatives that we're praying for their healing and that the guiding hands of whatever has to be done through surgery, that it will be carried out in a blessed manner. Lord, we ask that you continue to watch over my family, 
Watch over the pastor as he brings forth the word. Watch over his family. Watch over all that are here. Watch over the families and protect them. Father, we ask that you continue to guide and keep us. We ask these and all other blessings in no other name but your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Thank you, um, Apostle and Prophetess Williams, and thank you, Dr. Smith, and good morning again to everyone. Um, is there a word from the Lord? That question should be ringing in your spirits right now. No doubt you already know the answer. There is a word uh, from the Lord. Uh, I'm thankful that he allows me to yet one more time, um, even this morning, uh, be on this mount of privilege. Um, I will always tell you that I am not worthy um, in and of myself. I could do absolutely nothing but fail. Uh, but because of the spirit of the living God and because of the unction that he has placed upon me, his anointing that he has given me, uh, he has provided this day and this time for us to um, break the bread of life uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, knowing that it's not about what I do, it's about what the spirit of the living God does with me and with you. So uh, I honor him today. I honor him with my whole heart and I bless his holy name. Join us, uh, if you will, please, in a small prayer. God, we again say thank you for who you are because you are El Shaddai. You are God Almighty. There is none like you in heaven above nor earth beneath. And Father God, thank you for all that you do. Because you are Jehovah Jireh, you provide everything that we need according to your riches in glory. And Father God, we thank you for our brand new mercies. Thank you. Giving us another opportunity, Lord, to walk in those mercies and to find your grace Thank you for that grace, Lord, for your grace is your unmerited favor toward me and us so that we might again have an opportunity to serve, serve you while we have a chance. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I want to um, go back a little bit um, and, and read uh, the scripture. I'm going to read a little bit this morning, probably a little bit more than normal, but I have two scriptures that I want you to lend your thoughts to as we seek to um, uh, just break the bread of life uh, as the Lord has given it unto me. Um, first of all, in that uh, chapter of John 12 chapter, I'd just like to read just a couple of those verses or a few of them at least. Um, and it reads on this wise, beginning with verse number 23. And Jesus said unto them, the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And he that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. Thank you so very much. I'd like you to flip over to the book of Acts. Um, God has had me in that early church and, and I am still there. And I want you to keep your finger right there in the book of John the Gospel of John, but if you would turn over to the seventh chapter of the Chronicles of the Church, Book of Acts, and I would like for you to come down to verse number 55 of chapter 7. Verse number 55 of chapter seven of the book of Acts. It reads on this wise, King James Version, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven 
and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness, witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I would like to speak this morning just on the thought, my hour has come. My hour has come. I honor the spirit of Christ because this is a heavy time for me too. Um, in so many different ways, walking by faith, um, this season, uh, not, not because of what's going on external uh, to me uh, in terms of our city, state, nation, um, you know, it is what it is. Um, and we as uh, the church have to uh, be prepared to respond to the call. Um, but for me internally, uh, there is a great, um, there's a great whirlwind, if you will. It's not confusion. I know exactly what it is. It's not, um, it's not frustration. I know exactly who it is. And it's certainly not fear because I'm more than a conqueror. I hope you have the same testimony. Uh, this morning, I want to share again uh, with what God continues to share with me. It is totally um, apart from everything that you probably have been thinking about during the course of this week. Uh, but for whatever reason, God has me in this place and he is preparing me for something. I was listening this morning, uh, just to segue into, into this message. And, and uh, I just happened to catch uh, Dr. Charles Stanley and, uh, and um, Pastor Joel Osteen uh, on the television. And they were both uh, referring to uh, something very uh, similar in nature. Uh, different text, different thought, different uh, uh, delivery. Uh, but Pastor Charles Stanley was speaking about being on the right track, being on the right track. And he, he began to lay out several things uh, that he had used over the years. And he was adamant about the fact that he knew he was on the right track and he wanted to share with those who had an ear to hear those things that keeps him on the right track. I'm not going to go back and tell you what it was. You can go pull it up and, and, and see uh, title of the sermon is being on the right track. Um, and pastor Joel Osteen was speaking on, you know, hearing the voice of the Lord in your season hearing the voice of the Lord in your season might not have been his thought, but what my ears heard spiritually as he was speaking. And he was talking about the spirit of God visiting us at optune times. And when he does, he gives an insurmountable amount of faith to do something that he's requiring of us to do. And at that moment that we feel the presence of God and that elevation of faith being ignited on the inside of us is God's way of equipping us with everything we need to do the miraculous event that he has purposed in our hearts. 
and just really short. Uh, but he says that visitation or that anointing doesn't last. It's only there for a short time and it'll go away and it'll leave you in the same state that you found yourself in if you don't act on it. Those two, those two brief messages, probably no more than, you know, a couple of minutes apiece, just happened to be in the room with the television on and caught those two uh, messages this morning. And this morning, when I was asking God, Lord, you gave me this message, but you haven't given me a title yet. And he took me to this chapter uh, because he has already purposed my heart to teach on seed, just S-E-E-D, seed, or you can plural, S-E-E-D-S, seeds. And we'll be doing that during Bible study. I shared that with you on Wednesday night and we'll continue. But he took me to this 12th chapter in the gospel of John and he began to speak to my heart about this very verse, verse number 23. The hour is come that the son of man should be glorified. I want to talk this morning in respect to, of course, Jesus, but I also want to talk about Stephen, and I want us to see something, hopefully within ourselves, so that we too can get to the place where we can make the statement that my hour is come. See, you will listen to me, and you will think my hour is, is your hour. It, it's not. It ain't got nothing to do with you. It's my hour. God has spoke to my heart and that level of faith that I need, he's already impregnated me with. And I feel very strongly that my hour has come. Now, now, now I'll talk about my hour in a moment, but it won't be about me. It'll be about what God says to me to do. Now, why is it important to you? Because you are a part of me. Not because I want you to be a part of me, not because I handpicked you to be a part of me, it's because God set us together. So proximity-wise, we are so close to one another in the body of Christ that whatever he says to me affects you. What, what, am, what am I saying? So, so whenever I, I, I use my hand and I bend my wrist, my fingers respond. And when I bend my wrist, the, the, the ligaments and, and the tendons in my hand causes my fingers to move because they are so close in proximity to one another, the wrist will control the movement of the hand. Not totally, but it'll cause it to move. And, and that's the way bodies or you, you, you know portions of the body of Christ operate. It's not like you're not connected to 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 uh, the Potter's house, or it's not like you're not connected to to other other church families. But 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 because you're the hand and they're the foot, when they do something, your hand don't move it because the foot moved. But because you're the fingers on that hand, it affects. So my time is going to affect you. And I need y'all to catch a hold to what I'm saying, because if it's my time and God has us in such close proximity, then your hour is prevalent as well. And you need to be looking for it if you haven't already got it. Okay. So in this particular text that I read to you about Stephen, or Stephen, one of the deacons that were chosen after a situation occurred in the early church. You remember, we've been preaching about a Pentecostal movement. And, 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 and this Pentecostal movement, we focus on it because it is directly related to soul saving. It's directly related to, to folk coming to the 
knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Amen. So as we go through this early book of the church, the book of Acts, we begin to see some things transpiring. There was a great push and many were added to the church. You go back in the scripture, you see where there was over 3,000 added to the church and the, the priest number increased and so forth and so on. So there was a great move. And the Bible goes on to say that during that time, nobody had a need of anything. Now, now mind you, that there, there, there were some hiccups in the system as well. There were some people who wanted to be a part and tried to play the game, but the Holy Spirit exposed them. And this is not a part of the message that he gave me. I'm just giving it to you like he's giving it to me now. The Holy Spirit exposed them. Who am I talking about? Ananias and Sapphira. He exposed them because they were playing church. They acted like they wanted to be in the hour. But when it came time to their time, they couldn't live up to the small print. No, oh, I, I know I messed you up right there. What are you talking about, small print? The small print is a part of a contract that most of us don't ever read. We just sign because everything in the large print appeals to us. It's been written that way, so it would. But the fine print takes into consideration of the person who originated the contract. So no matter what you do, you're going to be connected or bound to what the contract owner wants. They ain't going to put you in contract if they're not going to get a benefit out of it. God is not going to go in contract with you if he doesn't have something that he wants of you. Does he need it? Mm -mm. That car dealership don't need your business. They can do without you. They like to have your business. And if you sign the dotted line, by default, you are part of their business. Why did I bring a car? Don't worry about the car. That's not what I'm focusing on. God called you to a contract. And he asked you to make your election sure. In other words, make sure you read the fine print. Because I'm going to tell you that there is something that's going to be required of you at a certain time. And when I come, I'm going to expect you to be ready. I don't know if Stephen thought about that when, when, when in verse number, chapter number six, they began to, 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 to put out an issue. That was going on. The Bible says in chapter number six of Acts, he says, and in those days, the numbers of the disciples were multiplied and there rose a murmuring of Grecians against the Hebrews. In other words, those who were not originally a part of the Jewish faith, but now are proselytes and have come into the faith. Amen. Those who were a part of, those who had the privilege of, were now cornering the market on what they wanted. And those who were not an original part, those who were engrafted in, were getting slighted. I'm not going to go into all of those details, but point one, problem. There's a problem. And your hour, my hour, comes as a result of a problem. God shows it to all of us. We see it. The world is hung up, hung up on, on, on racism and inequality and all of this. And ah, God doesn't have that problem. God says, because I'm not a respecter of man, I don't even see your color. I created you and your color don't matter. Why does it matter with man? They got a problem. They got to fix it. That ain't the church's problem. 
Church made it their problem because they segregated us. Who? Mankind. Segregated us so much so that now we can't even come in the same house of worship without somebody giving you an evil eye. So, so, so understand what I'm saying here. There was a problem in the church and the, and the, and the request went out from the apostles on this stage. It says in chapter, verse number two, it says, then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. I've got people around me that constantly keeps me in tune. Pastor, it's going to come a time where you're going to have to get rid of some things. And I'm very reluctant to let those things go. But I already know that my hour has come. And, and, and they go, they're going to have to, huh, they're going to have to get off the plate because what he's putting on my plate, all of it ain't going to be able to stay on there together. Amen. So watch, watch what he does. He says, the apostles says, now what I want you to do is I want you to, brethren, look out among yourselves seven, <laughs> watch this, men of honest report. Not just an honest report, but a requirement. Whenever a problem exists, especially in the body of Christ, we automatically come up with the antidote. Oh, y'all missed me on that one, didn't you? We come up with an inoculation, a serum for what's going to satisfy that problem. It, it don't take years to solve a problem in God's house. My hour has come. Amen. So, so, so what they said is, here is the prescription to take care of the problem. I, I, I don't know if you got your prescription yet, but I know I got mine. Amen. Here's the prescription to take care of the problem. And, and this is what is a mandate is that, number one, they must be full of faith. And, 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 and here's the thing about, about, about the church. The church was called because there was a problem. What was the problem? The problem was Jesus. Y'all waiting for something else, aren't you? Nah, Jesus was the problem. Jesus was the problem, and everybody on the outside of the church had thought they got rid of him. But the church's job was to make sure Jesus never died. Now, how was we going to do that? Because all we had to do was to remember his word. Yet though you were dead, yet shall you live. And if you abide in me, you shall never die. Now, 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 now when I say Jesus was the problem, Jesus was the problem for everybody on the outside. The church wasn't supposed to have the problem on the inside. They were just supposed to do what Jesus asked them to do. And it didn't happen. So they began to have problems. And watch this. So they went back to the beginning. And he says, the fix for this problem is that as you look out amongst yourselves, you got to find men of honest report, in other words, integrity. And, and, and it's interesting that integrity, amen, comes before Holy Ghost. Oh, man, I, I know y'all are looking at me and y'all waiting for me to get to the punchline, but I ain't running. I'm taking my time. Integrity comes before Holy Ghost. In other words, if you a liar, when you join the church, the church ain't gonna make you stop being a liar. If you don't have the integrity to come to God and say, I confess my sins and believe in you, Jesus, 
then you still a liar. Oh Lord, uh, unfortunately we got a lot of liars because they didn't read the small print. Why you keep bringing up this small print, pastor? Because the small print is important. Look at what they did and the first requirement was that they be full of faith. I'm stuck. I got integrity and full of faith and I'm stuck. I'm having a problem with being honest with myself about who I am. Are y'all with me? I'm having a problem confessing the things that continually besets me. I remember the book of Hebrews saying, listen, now, since we know that there is such a great cloud of witnesses, mm -mm, y'all missed it again. Witnesses are there and they are looking at your integrity. Don't, don't lie to me because what you are doing and getting ready to move into, we've already did. We've already accomplished. We've already did feats of faith. And I need you to understand integrity. And these witnesses sit there and they watch and they are watching. And he says, so let us lay aside every weight, everything that we're fighting with, everything that we can't shake, everything that prevents us from running a good race, everything that would prevent us from being a good model believer. We are having a problem with that. And sin. Jesus took care of the sin piece, but the weight is you having the integrity to say, Jesus, I need help. I need help. Now watch this. And they chose Stephen because, look at what it is here, because, <laughs> He was full of faith. In other words, the brother was sold out. Are you sold out? If you're sold out, your hour has come. If you're sold out on Jesus, your hour is coming. And it's prevalent right now. But watch this. In verse number five, he says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. In other words, they knew of his works already. This, the hand know your works, the fingers, are they a part of the work that God has started with a hand? Can you be counted on? Is your hour come? Did your hour line up to what God is saying to the body? Or you playing church? And I don't mean to be any other way but direct. They chose Stephen because there was a problem. And the problem required honesty, it required faith, and the third thing it required was the Holy Spirit. In other words, Stephen wasn't going to be able to do this thing by himself. Stephen was just a vessel. God spoke to Stephen and he said to him, I've got a job for you to do. I've got an assignment for you to do. This is the first time in the Bible that you've heard about this man. 
You don't hear about his education. You don't hear about his family. You don't hear about what he did. Only thing you hear about is that those that were in the church knew of his works and his honest report. They knew that this was a man that they could trust. They could count on. And this is the thing that they really knew that allowed Stephen to do what he did. They knew that if the Holy Ghost told him to do something, that he would do it. We as a body, a portions of the body of Christ, God speaks to us daily. Some, some of us don't even hear him talking no more. Some of us can just do whatever we want. I'm, I'm going to say this because I, I just want y'all to understand how serious this is for me. Some of us do whatever in the hell we want. Because that's all you manifest is hellish behavior. And it affects the rest of the body of Christ. Is your hour come? Are you still playing around with hell's toys? I, I, I'm just talking to you and me because my hour is here. I can't play with it no more. And here, Stephen, watch what happens next because he met the requirement. The problem was unfair treatment. The next thing was, here is the antidote. And the next thing was, who can we send? Who can we send if you still in the same place after 60 years and you ain't going nowhere, your hour ain't got here yet. If you still doing the same thing from 1992 to now, your hour has passed you by. Now stop by to ask you, is your hour come yet? You know when your hour will get here because your hour requires something of you. What does it require? It requires the small print. What's the small print, Pastor? I'm tired of you saying that. Turn back over to chapter 12 of John and look at the small print. The small print is this. Yeah, Romans 10 and 9 is awesome. We can do that with our eyes closed. If thou would confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the bold print. You learn that verse early. But this one, you forgot. And Jesus responded to Philip and Andrew in this text. If you read up a little bit farther, Jesus was right at the pinnacle of his earthly ministry. Everybody wanted to kill him, but he told his mama when he started out, my hour has not come. What do you want from me, woman? Don't you know? A lot of times in your life and, and in your early ministry, you begin to want to do things. You see people preaching on certain levels, folk laying hands, folk being recovered, and you want that, but your hour ain't came yet. God is still nurturing you and preparing you. Jesus went through three years of preparation to get to this point. My God, my God, my God, watch this. And he began to say to them, some Greeks came and wanted to meet Jesus. These would have never met Jesus because he gave us an illustration about who he allowed in his inner circle. Now you'll understand a little bit about why people don't allow you to get to the pastor and all of those offices that's getting ready to do a mighty work before they go to do it because they are not of the spirit. But in this 12th chapter, it's laid out that these Greeks came and, and they asked Philip, Philip, we'd like to meet Jesus. 
Yeah, we, we, we say we want to meet Jesus with our testimony of believing and confessing, but when the time comes for you to meet Jesus, I wonder if your hour will be ready. And look at this text in here. And he began to say to them in verse number 22 of chapter 12, Philip comes and tells Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tells Jesus that somebody want to meet him. Just read a little bit here. That. You'll get it. They wanted to meet him. They wanted to find out who this man is who's been able to open blind eyes and, and who this man is who's able to make crippled legs walk again and, and who this man is ultimately that can take Lazarus who was dead and raise him up after three days had gone by and still be with us. Man, them church and the folk would have killed him as soon as they could, but his time had not yet come. But look at what comes next. And at this particular juncture, the Bible says, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come. Oh, what, what, what's the hour? The hour now where I get a chance to show out. I get a chance to let you see what God has really put inside of me. I get a chance to tell you who it is that sent me and why I'm here and I've got the antidotes to your problem. My hour has come. Jesus lays out a little bit of the fine print. And the Bible goes on later on to say, and the disciples didn't understand it because the fine print is small, but it's powerful. He says to them, verily, verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die. I, I wanted to stop by this morning and give you an opportunity to see the fine print. Because after you make your profession of faith, after you join up with your local congregation, and after you find out where it is that you fit in the body, uh, 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 somebody is going to come to you uh, with a problem, and, 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 and now it's incumbent upon you to know that you know that you know why you're in the body. And I, I see right now that, that Jesus is getting ready to show them who he really is, and, and, and he makes this statement, a, less, a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies. It remains alone. In other words, could nobody living at that time handle the anointing that Jesus had on his life. He was by himself. He didn't call Peter, that boisterous disciple, to say, Peter, I want you to stand by my right. And he didn't call John, the disciple that he loved. And he said, John, pray for me. No, 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 not now. He says, this one I got to do by myself. So he, in his wisdom, Finishes the statement, but if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is the fine print because you've been looking for your miracle. You've been looking for your blessing. You, you've been looking for your increase. You, you've been looking for your abundance. But now you understand the fine print that except you die, your increase ain't coming. No, no, Pastor, you got that wrong because he says that, 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 that he, he came to give life and, and to give it more abundantly after you die. After you die, your hour is at hand. And it's time for you to put aside those weights that's causing a problem in your life. How do you put aside the weight? They are just things that you want. 
It's an attitude that you got to have. It's stuff that you say belong to you. Whenever you get to the point that you can say, take it all away. I don't need none of it. You're getting closer to your hour. Whenever you can say, smite me on my right cheek and, and I'll turn to you my left cheek. Yeah, you're, you're getting closer to your hour. Whenever, every time you turn around, the devil's hound heels is chasing you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now your hour is coming. You want to run at the first thought of trouble, but I stopped by to tell you a prerequisite for your choosing, for your calling is trouble. Brother Cliff, I want you to know something today, man. I, I, I finally am glad to say that I'm glad that God says your hour is at hand. I don't know how long you depended on that job. I don't know how long you put that job before everything. But the truth of the matter is God says I'm tired. I'm tired of that job and, and I want you for myself. I want to show you who I am. So, Brother Cliff, I know your time is at hand, boy. I know it is. And you better get ready because God is getting ready to do a wonderful thing in your life. All you got to do is accept the anointing, the faith. I heard you this yesterday morning on the prayer line. I heard you crying out to the Lord. Boy, don't you know I ain't heard you cry out like that since I know you? I'm getting personal now, but I just want to let you know what's going on. I, I, God is showing me whose hour is at hand with my hour. And I'm going to tell you, it ain't going to be because you got a lot of money. It ain't going to be because you got a lot of prestige. It's going to be because God says, I'm going to move some of that stuff out your way so you can see clearly the light of, how about I say it like this? You can see clearly the lamp in your pathway. Hallelujah, somebody. The lamp to your feet and the light to your pathway. And now, now, now watch Jesus as he continues to share this wisdom because I'm going to leave Jesus and go back to Stephen and then I'm going to be almost done, but I'm going to come back to Jesus. Hallelujah, somebody. Now watch this. And he says, he that loveth me or loveth his life shall lose it, but he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it until eternal life. If a man serves me, this is what you do when your hour come. You go to work. You go to work. If a man serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also my servant will be. If any man serves me, him will my father honor. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready to be honored. If. Your hour is at hand. The pandemic put us in a position. Amen. Racial equality prompted us for a defensive posture. Hallelujah. And now man showing his true nature that once you give me something you don't want me to do, that's exactly what I'm going to do, tells me what side he's on. The road that leads to destruction is wide and it'll be many that follow therein. I, I'm telling you there's some folk who thought they were doing good on Mount Rushmore when they followed the president down there. But the truth of the matter is that's just a wide road. But I stop by the day to tell you, narrow is the way that leadeth unto righteousness, and there be few that take it. Some of y'all don't want to believe that your hour is at hand. That's all right, because it just give me a little bit more elbow room when I'm headed down the Holy Ghost Highway. That's all right. I'll go if I have to go by myself. And 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 I get back to Stephen now, and, and I begin to see. Everything that God put in a package for Stephen, and as he began to, to run on to see what the end is going to be, the Bible says that he began to preach, and the word of God increased in the seventh verse of the 
seventh chapter, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen was full of faith and power and did wonders and miracles among the people, because his hour had come. Hallelujah, somebody. When your hour come, you don't sit on a seat of do nothing. You find a way to get out where the trouble is. You find a way to find out what it is that your master, your Lord, and your savior wants of you. What would you have me do? Stop asking folk what your purpose is. Talk to God and God will let you know right away. But when you're chosen to solve a problem, Darkness encamps itself around you. Why does darkness encamp itself around you? Because darkness flees from light. So everywhere Stephen went, look at it now, look at it now, catch it. Darkness followed him. Everything that Stephen did, darkness was around him. So much so that the darkness that was inside of the house of God came upon him and covered him and Stephen was light and it made him mad. Devils don't like it when you do what God tell you to do. Oh man, they want to take you out. They want to snuff you out. That's how you know your hour is at hand. Amen. Because now you got trouble on every side. Amen. Now you've got one that's sitting right in the house with you, one that's on the job. You got another one that, 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 that's in the family extended. You got them all over the place. But the truth of the matter is, your hour has come. Hallelujah, somebody. Don't let that bother you because they ain't your enemy. It's the enemy that's using them in order to throw you off your hour. Oh, man, y'all ain't hearing me right now. But your hour is here. So let's see what Stephen faced in his hour. It says that the church, watch this, not necessarily the church, but that old church, the temple, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and all of those that were a part of that body, they came upon him because he was too powerful. Now I understand why I'm attacked. You ought to understand why you're attacked. When the anointing of God is upon your life, devils are drawn to you. It's almost like being on a football field and it's totally dark, but then they turn the, the lights on. Listen, the darkness don't run right away, but it starts fleeing right away. Because as that light from that stadium begins to warm up, the darkness in that stadium moves out of the way. And when that light is fully fluorescent, when it's fully shining, it's brighter than the noonday. Somebody ought to hear what I'm about to say. That the light around your life now has become so bright. This ain't the time for you to get a big head. This ain't the time for you to lose your humility. This ain't the time for you to act like you all of that and a bag of chips. This is the time for you to decrease. John said it this way, Lord calls me to decrease that you may increase. This is the time that you get your best humility at work. This is the time when they slap you, you smile at them and you just turn the other cheek. This is the time that you say like Jesus, how can I ask you to deliver me from this hour? When it was for this very hour that you brought me. Yeah, I got some hard things in my life. I got some things that's dealing with me. And the closer I get to January 1st, the more the devil wants to bother me. But that's all right. Because I know my hour has come. As I prepare to close, Stephen did something. In the chapter number seven, and I'm leading up to chapter number eight, which will be next week as we begin to prepare for our new beginning. Listen to what I'm saying to you. The priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees all decided, what are we going to do about this man? They done forgot about Paul. Excuse me. They done forgot about Peter and John and James. They done forgot about all the old fellas. 
This is a deacon. A deacon. Y'all want to, you know, throw that office to the side, but if, if, if you in that office, you better be ready to walk upright and circumspect. That's a big office. This was a deacon who had turned the environment upside down. And they met and they counseled with each other. What can we do? And I don't want to tell you the whole story because you can read it for yourself. But I looked at the defense of Stephen. After he had did wonders and miraculous signs, and he had to deal with the devil face to face. This is how he dealt with that devil. He began at the beginning. Sometimes you got to stop trying to pick it up middle ways the street. Sometimes you just got to go back to the beginning and he began to tell them about Moses and, and Abraham and he began to tell them about how they persecuted all of the prophets of all and, and which of these have not you tried to kill and you killed one called Jesus. You thought you did, but you didn't realize that he understood the fine print and, and, and watch this. When you killed him, you missed him because you moved on to what you were doing before him. And now I'm a seed of him. I'm a product of him. And you don't know what to do with me, so you want to do the same thing that you dealt with him. And the Bible says at the latter part of that chapter 7, and as he was full with the Spirit, full of the Holy Ghost, and after they had used every fear tactic that they could use, that Stephen began to look up into heaven and the glory of God and Jesus standing on his right hand and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand. I don't know about you, but I'm beginning to think like Jesus was thinking, except a corn of a kernel falls in the ground and dies. It abides alone. But I'm so glad that Stephen in this particular text didn't forget who he was or whose he was. He looked up unto heaven and opened, amen, the doors. And these are the doors, I believe, that Malachi was talking about when we look up to the hills from which cometh our help, the Bible says in Malachi, now prove me now herewith if I won't open you the windows of heaven. And I believe Stephen looked up in order to say, where are you, God? I need you right now because my hour has come and my enemies have encamped themselves around me. They want to eat up my flesh and they want to take the life out of this soul body. But I'm glad I heard him cry out with a loud voice, Jesus, here I am. I have did nothing but what you you did. Here I am, and my enemies are coming upon me now. They've got fingers in their ears. They've got their heart dead set on stone in me, but I see you now. I see the windows of heaven. I see you, Jesus. I see you, and I'm glad that this moment was afforded me in my hour that I don't go out with a lack of hope. But I'll leave this place knowing that God has smiled on me. Yeah, I had to lay down my life and take up his cross. But when I carried that cross and I looked up, it pointed to Christ. 
And Christ uh, said, trouble yourself not. Uh, if you believe in God, uh, believe also in me. Uh, in my Father's house uh, are many mansions. Uh, look at me, Stephen. Uh, don't worry about what they're doing to your body. Uh, be more afraid uh, of the one that killed the body and the soul. Uh, Stephen dropped down on his knees. Uh, I believe Stephen was going to pray one last time. Uh, and Stephen said, Lord, uh, forgive them. Uh, don't charge this to them. Uh, I know uh, I can't ask you uh, to deliver me from this hour. Uh, for this is the hour that you sent me. Uh, I stopped by the day to tell you uh, that it's the same hour that Jesus had to endure as they took him to the Calvary's cross. I stopped by the day to tell you that just like Stephen, Followed in Jesus' footsteps, watch this, that you and I too must become that kernel of corn that has to fall in the ground and die. Why, 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 why Brother Reggie, do I need to die? Because he can't use you as you. He's got to use you as him. And here's the truth of the matter. As Stephen laid his life down and, 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 and forgave them, hallelujah, somebody, for what they were doing, they didn't realize it, but they were instrumental in becoming a part of a new day for the church. Stephen was the first martyr to die in the new church. And in order for the new church to multiply, there had to be some deaths. Subsequently, the apostles would die. But before they could die, they had to plant the seed. Oh, y'all don't hear me. <laughs> Because the Bible says, and next week I'll talk about this, that the church scattered. And the only ones who remained were the apostles. And their job was to bury Stephen. And the thing about this is, next week's lesson, I got to go there next week. But the thing about Stephen's death that parallels with Jesus' death and that has to parallel with your death and my death. Don't get it twisted. I'm not asking you to get put in a coffin and sunk into the ground. I'm asking you to put your mandate now that you have for yourself. Two Sundays ago, I preached a mandate to the church. Last week, Apostle preached the church's response. This week, after you respond, your hour is come. And what is God really saying? Don't pay attention to the pandemic. That's just something to throw you off. What God is saying is I'm looking for seed. I'm looking for people who want to be a part of a new beginning. I'm looking for someone who's willing to read the small print. And the small print just simply says, except a corn, just one kernel falls into the ground and dies. Are you willing to die today? Are you willing to let your behaviors die? Are you willing to lay down your life as Christ laid his life down? I want to close with this. And I want you to understand that in this season, we've got a job that's very important. And that's why I said I'm troubled on the inside. Because this is the time that the church fortifies herself. The world is preoccupied with other things. 
the church has to be fortified in what God has for her to do. See, because you might have thought that Jesus' resurrection was a mistake. You might have thought that they killed him on happenstance. You might have thought that it was just signs of the time when Gabriel came and asked for his body and Nicodemus and, and those who were large in the temple came after being proselyted and took his body to his disciples and buried it in a borrowed tomb. You, you, you might have thought that that just had to be because he knew he could raise himself up again. You might have thought that when he made that comment that if you destroy this temple, that I'll raise it up in three days. You just might have thought those were words, but no, 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 my brother, my sister, those were the indication of Jesus' hour coming to fulfillment. His hour of coming to fulfillment meant that he had accepted the small print, that in order for me to live, I must die. When the enemy thought we got him, he said, all you did was help me multiply. Because as he closed himself up, in all of that sin, in all of that dirt, I don't know about you, but it's from the dirt that you came and the dirt that you shall return. Here is the truth of the matter, that shell of dirt Allow the incubation period for him to lay down his seed, knowing that it wasn't going to stay down, but on that third day morning, he was going to get up. And because he offered that seed of his life, look at the multitude of life that exists now. Look at you and me. And look at all of those who are of the household of faith. That's because Jesus, our, had come. How do you represent Jesus? This is how we represent him. And this is why this message is so important to you and me. That when you love somebody, regardless if they love you or not, Jesus says, I am love. You plant a seed. When you tithe of your income, you plant a seed. When you have good thoughts and you carry them out, you plant a seed. Every time you do something that's obedient to the will and the word of God, you plant a seed. You die daily. And because of the death, don't ever think that your love goes without return. Because for every seed of love you plant, you plant a miracle in your life. And if you give God his due benevolence, that seed is gonna come back with a miracle from you. Every time you pay your tithes, God is gonna bring back a miracle for you. Every time you're obedient to Christ, He's raising up another miracle. If you missing miracles in your life, you ain't sowing no seed. And I need you to know something, that Jesus died 
so that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. My time has come. My time has come. Has your time come? Talk to the Lord and see if you are part of this end time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Father, I thank you again for who you are and all that you've done. I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for speaking to our hearts. I thank you for using Stephan, and I thank you for allowing us to see his behavior in Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for allowing him to die. Lord, that there might be an increase. His death, Lord, leads us into next week's lesson. Prepare our hearts and our minds to receive it so that you would receive the glory, the honor, and the praise from all that we do and all that we say. God, have your way, and we'll be careful in the midst of it to give your name praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. I thank God for you, and um, we open up to...